what would you do if uh, the world war 3 becomes today or tomorrow would you hide would you fight would you i don't know what would you do you can leave your comments below today i'm going to ask uh, this question very good friend of mine uh, who has already been guest in my podcast at the end of last year Orlando Andy Wilson and uh, his security expert he has written many books I highly recommend you to read his books but also I recommend you to read my books <laughs> so in today's uh, podcast with uh, Andy uh, we will try to uh, give you some insights about uh, what's the current situation are we really heading towards uh, global conflict and if yes what you should do and what should you avoid doing so stay tuned and the uh, podcast will start uh, in few seconds Hello, welcome back to uh, Peacemaker by Adnan Habul. I'm your host, Adnan, uh, and today we have a very special guest, uh, Orlando uh, Andy Wilson, security expert, as I said, and uh, I will immediately uh, say hi. How are you, sir? Very good. How is life treating you? Yeah, good, good, good. A little bit busy, but can't complain. No problems. Uh, Other people's no. problems. Uh, last time we met, uh, it was the end of uh, 2023. And uh, a lot of things have been uncertain. Uh, some things were in preparation. If you recall that... Uh, uh, in Red Sea, the uh, whole fleet was uh, piling up uh, to stop uh, the blockade of Houthis. Uh, so, meanwhile, uh, there was exchange of fire, a lot of fire. So, can you give us some updates and your opinion about all that situation? My opinion on the Houthi situation and the Red Sea situation is I think the West has bitten off more than it can chew. Because I think this comes down to they didn't do any assessment on who they were dealing with. And they just thought, OK, we can send some warships in there, drop some bombs and these people will run away. Oh, well, the Houthis are not really people to run away. Mm. Culturally. Um, they've been fighting a war now for how many years? Nine years, I think. Um, their civil war. So I think even they've come out and said, okay, we've been fighting a war for how many years? We've been under sanctions for how many years? Um, you tried to starve us, cut off medical aid, and you know what? We're still here. So I think they've got the upper hand because they understand the terrain, they understand the ground, and they have plenty of munitions. And if you're looking at the Red Sea, uh, especially as it goes into the Suez Canal, it's a very small area of water. So that area of water is very easy for them to control. It's a channel. It's, an, it's, it's, it's a choke point. It's perfect for ambushing. And there's not much you can really do. Well, there's not much you, you can really do to stop them. I think already um, there's a British warship that's had to go for maintenance. And the Houthis are saying they hit it. We don't know. But again, the thing is with warships, it's they have to be resupplied. So at some point, you can't keep it constantly on station. 
that ship has to go and be refueled, resupplied with weapons, etc., etc. So I think it's a very, very difficult situation. I think the only way out of it is negotiation, and that's it. Do you think uh, that situation can escalate more? I don't think so. I think the Houthis want what they want, and that's it. They're saying they want, um, they're doing this because of Gaza. Um, I can't see them spreading things much further. Maybe hitting um, the U.S. bases in Djibouti, which is within their missile range, um, and maybe other locations within the Middle East. Because before, uh, I think a couple of years ago, they've managed to fire missiles into UAE. So their missiles have the range. Um, will they do it? Who knows? You're dealing with the Houthis. If they get upset enough and decide to do it, they're going to do it. There's nothing you can do to stop them. And again, a lot of the missile defense systems these days, they work to an extent, but they're not 100%. Well, uh, I, I was reading uh, your uh, uh, materials that you occasionally uh, published on LinkedIn and I noticed uh, that uh, uh, you have uh, very unconventional view points on various issues and uh, what uh, catch my eye was uh, that uh, UK is not uh, ready for any war so can you <laughs> tell us more about well I'm British originally, and again, it's like I look at UK at the moment, and it's a joke. The country's gone too woke, too globalist. It's a joke. And this funny thing the Brits have come out talking about mobilization. The people don't want it, and somebody sent me a video. The guy will be watching this the other day. And there's some guy there, um, British guy, he says he's a patriot and everything else, saying, well, the government's been targeting people like me for the last how many years, and what I've been saying on social media, because I'm not a globalist, I don't support LGBTQ, whatever. Um, but the government's been bashing the people they want fighting for them. And now they're expecting to wave a flag and to go and fight for them, which I don't think will happen. It will be chaos. As far as the British military is concerned, they don't have the manpower. They don't have the resources. They don't have the equipment. As I said, one warship, uh, I think one destroyer had to come out of the Red Sea to be for maintenance. Um, the British flagship, I think the Queen Elizabeth, whatever, uh, the aircraft carrier was going to join some NATO exercise. It didn't even, I think it got out of port and broke down. So what are they going to do? It's a small, Britain's a small country. At one point, it had a large army. It controlled a lot of the world. Not these days. And I think the thing is these days, especially when I hear the unelected prime minister, Rishi, whatever his name is, going on saying, oh, we'll fight Russia. You know what? I'd like to see him at the front <laughs> leading the troops to fight Russia. Because to me, he's one of these guys that would cry if his uh, milk was uh, sour in the morning. You know what I mean? For him, that would be a major disaster. So I think him talking about war is like, a Barbie doll talking about war. Yeah, I, uh, I laughed uh, when you mentioned uh, Rishi Sunak uh, to lead. Uh, you know, it's... Uh, you probably watched my uh, previous video, uh, War Veterans uh, message. Uh, and yeah, actually, uh, uh, I think uh, the world is lacking true leaders. You know? 100%. Uh, those who have uh, knowledge, experience, guts to make uh, right decisions at the right uh, time, right place. You know, I don't see many, uh, I don't see any actually uh, world leader, especially in European Union. And it's no wonder that uh, we are watching what we are watching now uh, in many countries in EU. Somebody said to me, a German guy, political, he's very much into the political stuff. And he said, when the when things happened with Ukraine, up until Ukraine, all the European leaders were shouting, peace, 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 we're for peace, we're for this, we're for that. Mm -hmm. Overnight, they went into war. We need to... Or mode. We need 
war mode, we need weapons, we need this, we need that. Okay, if somebody goes from being a complete pacifist and promoting peace, and in a fraction of a second they go to being a psychopath, they're psychopaths. Because they threw out the window all the supposed values they had before to go to war with Russia, and instead of saying, okay, let's negotiate, let's sort out a peaceful let's sort this out peacefully, they went straight into war mode. Okay, well, for the past how many years you've been saying, telling people what pacifists you are and you want peace. To switch that quickly, they got problems, mental problems. Do you think uh, UK uh, did a good job with Brexit uh, because uh, we can see uh, <laughs> we can see that uh, whole Europe uh, is now... European Union is uh, caught by big time protests, uh, you know, of uh, farmers and stuff. Well, the farmers can't protest in UK because they'll get arrested. Ah. <laughs> if, if you're an environmental protester, they're not going to arrest you. But I'm sure in UK, if the farmers started to protest, they would arrest them. UK has got a lot of, it's not, how can I put it? I look at UK now and you don't have that much. UK is a monarchy, not a democracy. Mm. So you don't have that many freedoms. The freedoms they have are pretend freedoms. And there's been, there was a good video out recently. Um, these environmental protesters are blocking the roads. The police aren't doing anything about it. They're bringing them cups of water and cups of tea and everything else. And there was a worker, a guy who most probably needs to get to work, has a job, pay for his family, I mean, earn money, got out of his van and started dragging these people out, out, out of the way, out of the road. They arrested him. Well, they let the, these environmental protesters block the road. Mm -hmm. So where's your law and order? Which side are the police on? And this is where I think the UK has gone so globalist, so woke, it's completely lost its identity. I don't, I tell people now, I look at United Kingdom when I was there, my family's from there from year dot. I'm British. I'm Cornish. Yeah. I look at it now and I say it doesn't exist anymore. It's gone. It's lost. As a country, I would say it's lost and it's going to be going downhill very, very, very fast. And as I can see, situation in European Union, also in UK and Western Balkans, which is in Europe, mm -hmm. but not in EU. It's the Balkans. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, the situation doesn't seem to be better, you know, especially because of that situation in Red Sea, you know, uh, mostly shipments are going to Europe through that route. So that would uh, increase prices and that would uh, trigger even higher uh, inflation rate and uh, you know devaluation of depreciation so we are heading in in very turbulent uh, historical points but this is the thing shouldn't people be thinking about this before they start bombing people mm. that should be part of the threat assessment that should be part of the overall assessment before you go to war the economic factors the political factors the human right factors not just thinking, we'll bomb some people, we'll bomb the Houthis, and they'll shut up. Well, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. But I think this is where you look at NATO as a whole, they've been used to fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan against lightly armed tribesmen. Um, really, the they had the upper hand. Now you're dealing with people with sophisticated weapons, uh, even though the drone stuff these days doesn't have to be sophisticated. They're dealing with... It make, you see now a combination of sophisticated weapon systems in the hands of people that's fighting unconventionally. Mm. And that is complete. That's a complete game changer as far as war is concerned. Drones have changed things completely. I done a video recently. IR, infrared, has changed the game completely. And so these days, if we go back how many years, to have a drone, that was the elite of the elite. Now you've got kids with drones, and those drones can be modified to carry weapons. Yeah. FPV, so, first-person view drones, they are more effective than uh, than any yeah. artillery. 
Yeah, hundred percent. I was. I don't think we put the video out yet. We done something when I was in Greece with Dionysus. Um, the drone operators are the new snipers. Yeah. Yeah. Because a drone can reach out for how many kilometers? It can go around corners. It can go. It can go in all different directions. Bullets have to fly straight. Yeah. If you combine that with um, facial recognition, anything can happen. Yeah. So I think this is where it's you see the situation in the Red Sea. It's it's highlighting the deficiencies in NATO. And I think NATO going around the world now saying, OK, we can do this, we can do that. They're going to lose in Ukraine. They've been made a laughing stock in the Red Sea. So what are they going to do next? And I think instead of sensibly looking at things and saying, OK, we need to cut back because we're punching above our weight, they're still going forwards. And all that's going to happen is they're going to end up getting knocked out completely or falling flat on their face. Uh, do you think uh, NATO would, uh, would be able to survive uh, uh, if uh, uh, Donald Trump would be re-elected? Who knows? He wasn't happy with them before. But I think this is something where, if you're talking about it from a political situation, I spent a lot of time in the United States, 18 years. Um, I think Trump, even though he's not perfect, can actually rectify things and bring some sensible some, some sensibility back. Is he going to be happy about NATO? I don't think so. He wasn't happy about them before because US has been supporting everything. So again, even when you look at this uh, thing in the Red Sea, they said there's a uh, how many different countries involved? Well again, it's the British and the Americans. I think the Indians have turned up And again, where's everybody else? I think the Nether some of these countries, I'm not going to mention because I can't remember, said, oh, we had an advisor or a couple of officers in the command in the command center. So that's how much you're investing in NATO. Yeah, so I, I think, think Norway is also participating and Netherlands. Do they have ships? I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, they're participating, they're waving a flag, right? We're here, give us some money. But they're not sending assets. Do they have the assets? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now it's uh, okay. Uh, now it's totally uh, different situation. Uh, if I compare two years ago, it's almost uh, anniversary of uh, full scale uh, aggression against Ukraine by Russia. And At, th at that time, uh, it was, uh, you know, Russians obviously were not ready for that that kind of resistance. But now, uh, Russian economy actually is boosting up, uh, avoiding sanctions, and even uh, making uh, more and more uh, war machinery running up so that uh, worries uh, many countries so that's why i i don't know what uh, trump uh, would uh, think in in such circumstances because you know he's a, a guy uh, who you cannot predict you can do I whatever think... but you cannot pred predict what he is going to do i think he would negotiate that's it there's no point there's no there's only There's only money in war for a select few, and that's the arms manufacturers, et cetera, the industrial, the, the military industrial machine. So the money goes to the elites. To the general population, they just get killed, killed, wounded, et cetera, et cetera. And if you look at Ukraine, it's, it's a, all, I'd say the problem is very, very negotiable. Some wars can't be negotiated. This is a negotiable, negotiable problem. And again, I think they're reporting today that the U.S. has done a, a, an audit and Ukraine is missing at least one billion dollars of the equipment that was sent to them because it's corruption. Ukraine was corrupt before. It was the most corrupt country in Europe. Yeah, I have been in Ukraine and uh, I remember uh, You know, the war didn't start uh, back in 
2022. Yeah. It started in 2014. And uh, people who didn't want to serve their army, to, to be conscripted, they could uh, easily get uh, papers from from the doctor. You know, they pay a few hundred uh, bucks and uh, they they get paper like, I'm fine, yeah. I'm, you know. But uh, uh, after February 2022, it's only, uh, you know, that... Uh, uh, pay uh, payment uh, actually became more expensive, you know, <laughs> to get papers to get out from the country. You know, if you are uh, suitable for military, you just needed to pay in the beginning six thousand US dollars. Now I think it's more than ten thousand, but uh, still a lot of people are. Uh, you know, roaming through EU countries and they are uh, good for service. So there are millions of them outside. But this is back down to, do they want to fight? It's like what most, I'm sure most of the Ukrainians are looking at this now saying, well, what are we fighting for? Do they, would... usually, do they actually care about that part of the country that much? Or do they say, okay, we'd sooner have peace and somehow sort of re restructure the borders and let everybody get along, make money and be happy. Well, maybe they they feel they have nothing to fight about, uh, but uh, I don't think so, actually. This is a pure example how corruption mm. uh, can destroy yeah. the country. Yeah. Completely. And because... I think corruption... Yeah. Corruption with Ukraine is, is going to get worse. They're on about, okay, the rebuilding of Ukraine. How many people have died? How many people have left? They reckon how many childbearing, women of childbearing age have left and they're not going back. So Ukraine's going to have a major issue as far as population. How are they going to repopulate Ukraine? Who's going to want to live there? Who's going to go there and work on construction sites to rebuild the country? Well, unless uh, forced... Uh... To, to leave, I think uh, about 90% of uh, Ukrainian refugees would uh, rather stay in EU yeah. countries. Yeah. They won't yeah. come back. But I think Ukraine's a mess, and I think it's, um, I don't know, I think it's a mess, and I think a lot of people have been misled into the reasons for Ukraine, and I think only history is going to tell the truth, hopefully. But again, I think it's been a complete mess, complete waste of money, complete waste of life, especially a waste of life. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have died unnecessarily. So the question is, how long and how far Putin is going to go? Uh, I assume, uh, and I think I, I put that uh, in, in one of my videos, that uh, if... Uh, if uh, the Russian army would uh, take over control of uh, uh, Odessa, uh, then they would make uh, uh, Ukraine landlock country, mm. uh, which would not be able to easily export uh, the grains. That would additionally increase prices for food and additionally fuel economy crisis in the world. But uh, on the other hand, uh, Putin would uh, establish connection uh, with uh, Transnistria, uh, which is the breakaway uh, portion of uh, Mol Moldova. So mm -hmm. I don't think uh, uh, Putin would uh, deliberately uh, move on any NATO country, but what do you think? Maybe he would. I don't think so. Why? I think they've already said, what's Europe got? They got Europe's got no resources. Yeah, he can blackmail. Uh, okay, we, we can see Germany economy is uh, on the knees uh, because of lack of gas. They need Russian gas. They need Russian gasoline. Yeah. I think there was a video the other day of a Russian tanker going into Rotterdam, delivering gasoline, delivering oil or natural gas. So the so Europe needs Russia. 
yeah. it's back down to who blew up the Nord Stream. It wasn't Russia. Yeah, definitely not. So I think the Russians are happy to do business with Europe because Europe needs Russia. Russian, Russia doesn't need Europe. And I think that's become clear. Yeah, actually, uh, there was uh, assessment uh, why uh, the sanctions uh, don't work against Russia simply because uh, 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 they switch to currencies uh, of BRICS countries. It's down to now, if we look at it, as far as adaptability. People have to, again, to me, we cut it, I cut everything down to the basics. If humans don't adapt, animals adapt. Humans are very bad at adapting. So Russia has adapted to this situation very, very quickly. And it's prospered. They've struck a major division now between the old world, world, the old new order, the old world order, and this new world order. They've fractured it completely. So again, you've got Russia, which really is in its current context with a new country. Because communism collapsed, it was, we can say it, was reset with communism and it was reset when communism left. So Russia is what, 30 years old, 40 years old? Yeah. 90 is 30 it's years old. The new Russia, Russia is 30 years old. They're adapting, they're thinking, they're they're progressing. They've got the flexibility to progress. And let's go back to bashing, I'll bash Europe, I'll bash United Kingdom. United Kingdom is a monarchy. They still worship some king that dresses up in a fancy dress, right? So again, it's like they're that stuck in their way of doing things. They're not as flexible and adaptable as Russia. Why? Because they're that, I could use the term brainwashed, they're that brainwashed, they're that set in their ways. They don't have the flexibility and adaptability that Russia and these other new countries have. And times are changing fast. If you want to stay in, and this is, we can, we can pin this on the Red Sea as well. If you want to stay in the colonial days where you just send a warship offshore and fire a few cannons into a colony somewhere and say, okay, behave yourself or else. Okay, those days are gone. And I think this is one thing with United Kingdom. They've yet to come to the realization they're no longer a colonial power. All their wealth is stolen. They need to admit that all their wealth is stolen. Okay, you can't steal it anymore. So what are you going to do in the future? You have to start being nice to people, start negotiating with people, because they're not going to allow you to steal their stuff. And again, going to war, your people don't want to fight for you anymore because they don't like what's happening within the country. Well, uh, it's a uh, very grim uh picture that i can see uh when when i go deeper into analysis of uh, each region in the world uh for instance uh, china is uh, just about uh, to do something about uh, uh, taiwan and the question is is uh, United States uh, really up to the task uh, to defend Taiwan against China? I see some stuff. I, I don't pay much attention to Asia, but what I've seen about the Chinese military, it's very, very disciplined. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of it. They've got a lot of troops. They've got a lot of missiles. They've got a lot of artillery. They've got a lot of tanks, a lot of planes. So just on a numbers game, I, I think to deal with China would be extremely difficult. And the thing is with the Chinese, if they lose people, they don't care because they got a lot more people to come after them. So I think would the US go to war with Taiwan for Taiwan? I think the US has got a lot on its plate already. And I think looking how the current administration, the Biden administration is dealing with things at the moment, I think a war in Taiwan, most Americans will be like, what the hell's going on? Where they're helping out with Israel, they're, help, they're dealing with Ukraine, and now another war. And this president should be a peacekeeper. He's far from it. They're causing too much trouble.
So do you think uh, United States would be capable to wage war against Iran over Israel? Do they want to? That's the question. Could they? They could do it. I'm sure they I can could... see they're avoiding uh, that. Yeah, they are. Con confrontation. 100%. Yeah. Because Iran, again, is very powerful. I've said to people before, I was talking about this years ago with one of my associates, and we're looking um, how many years ago when this was kicking off in the Persian Gulf. And I said to him, okay, there's American warships in the Persian Gulf. The Iranians have hundreds, if not thousands, of fast boats that can be weaponized with torpedoes or whatever, suicide boats. They only have to be successful once. Yeah, they, they can, can Yeah, they can easily cut off Hormuz uh, Strait uh, and no oil for for the rest easy. of the world. They have oil. Yeah. So again, it's like they could do the same situation the Houthis are doing in the Red Sea and the Suez Canal, they could do the same thing to the Persian Gulf. UAE mm -hmm. Uh, Bahrain, Kuwait, Saudi are all within easy missile range of Iran. Mm -hmm. And again, does the UAE, um, you mean, I like the UAE, I think it's a great country, but again, it wouldn't take much for Iran just to put UAE completely out of business. But uh, I, I heard uh, both Iran, uh, UAE, and 32 plus countries uh, are join are planning to join BRICS. Yeah, because they see the future. Yeah. They see what's going on. Again, before all of this, before this started with the Houthis, I think a lot of countries, I think Saudi Arabia, and I think possibly U UAE has always been friendly with Iran. I think Saudi Arabia started up um, diplomatic relations with Iran again. Everybody was mending. Because I think everybody's beginning to see this endless war is good for the U.S. selling weapons. It's good for the elites, the elites in the U.S. and the elites in U.K. selling weapons. But it's no good for everybody else. Mm -hmm. So welcome back uh, after a short break. Uh, I will ask uh, one uh, uh, one question that I promised uh, to ask our guest, uh, Andy Wilson. Uh, uh, try to imagine, as a security expert, try to imagine uh, that World War Three starts today or tomorrow. What would you do and what would you recommend our audience to do or to avoid doing? Do you have any idea? A lot of it depends on which side you're on. Okay. Yeah, depends where you are. Let's have a look at it from, uh, we've been talking about Europe, a European's perspective, a European Union perspective. Um, people, we can take it, there's going to be martial law. So people are going to have to do what they're told. Um, one of the big issues is going to be the economy. Are people going to have enough money? Is their currency going to devaluate? Do they have other assets such as gold, jewelry, or something? Um, so again, I would say the lucky people would be living in more of the rural areas. And again, you look at it where... We talked about UK earlier. Um, when I was growing up in UK, a lot of people, you weren't self-sufficient, but I'm from Cornwall originally. There's a lot of fishing, rabbits, etc. You lived off what was caught, what was hunted. People grew their own food. Most people in Europe don't do that these days. And it's funny being in, spending a lot of times in the Balkan areas, people here are still self-sufficient. You go into the villages, people can still, they still live. They're not dependent on a supermarket. So I think one of the issues, and we talked about supply chain before, um, how are people in, say, UK or Western Europe, where's their food going to come from? Are they going to be rationed? Um, we talked about money. 
if you're moving to a rural area, if you're lucky enough to be able to move to a rural area, okay, are you going to put up with people coming and trying steal and coming and trying to steal what you have? If there's a breakdown, and we've seen some breakdowns in when was the last big riots in France a while a while back? There was big riots in France. Okay, how are you going to deal with civil unrest? Is there going to be enough resources to deal with that civil unrest? Um, the trouble is with most of Europe, most people don't even have firearms. It's illegal. In the UK, you can't own a gun. Well, you can, but it's very, very restricted, too much paperwork. It's not like the United States. And I know air people in the United States, they're very much into the, the homesteading, which they'll go and live in the country area and they'll grow their own food. They have their own wells. Of course, they have guns for self-defense and hunting, but you can't do that in most of Europe. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, when I said World War Three, uh, everybody would uh, think uh, first about uh, nuclear uh, war. But uh, let's dismiss that uh, option uh, because it would be the end. Definitely, you know. What can you do if there's a nuclear war? There's what, not much yeah, you can do. Yeah, whatever, whatever you do, uh, it's, uh, you know, useless because... Uh, you know, food, water, everything would be uh, so right. radioactive that uh, nobody would be able to survive. Even those so-called preppers, uh, they wouldn't be able to survive uh, longer than maybe a few months and that's it. That's it. So that I think people have said that, oh, we need to nuke these countries, we need to nuke Iran, we need to do yeah. They don't know what they're talking about. It's ridiculous. But I'm it talking... I'm talking That's about uh, conventional war, uh, mm. but you know uh, we we already mentioned uh, conventional wars are no longer like uh, First World War or Second World War. Now we mm. have uh, very smart uh, birds, so-called drones, uh, and stuff like that. Uh, you know, uh, definitely. I, as a war veteran, uh, I. I uh, I, I don't dare to imagine how a uh, terrible situation would be for those who are fighting and also for civilians. We yeah. would be all like uh, like in Gaza. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And... It's just the stuff like night vision has changed things. Night vision, thermal imagery, drones have changed things massively. Yeah. yeah. So... Back in... I think one. Sorry, yeah. go on. Uh, I was going to say one thing we didn't talk about is the political aspect as well of martial law, because again, there's a lot of people. If the, if another world war did break out, there's a lot of people who would be vocally against it, and there are a lot of people. Again, I'll use UK as an example. There's I think three thousand people a year being arrested there for posts on social media. So again, and again, you look what happened in Ukraine, and this we say this could work either side. When either side takes over an area, they're going to be looking for those that the collaborators with their opposition. So this would be, I think, for a lot of people, martial law. Um, a lot of people would have to be very careful what they're saying. And again, if their areas were occupied, that would be huge problems for a lot of people. So again, yeah. what are you going to do in that situation? Then back to what happened during the Second World War, there'd be a massive refugee. Uh, where would refugees go these days from Europe? There's nowhere to go. So would you recommend in that case uh, to to be careful what you are writing on uh, social media? I don't care. I'm past caring. <laughs> yeah, I'm already I'm already labeled. I go, I'm on too many lists. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so, uh, martial law... Uh, means no freedom uh, you you mean nothing you know exactly yeah just yeah and, and nothing yeah. else and it doesn't matter how much money do you have as as you said money would definitely uh, be worthless doesn't matter how much uh, gold do you have you cannot eat gold and you cannot yeah, sell it. food so money. because uh, everybody is busy with war. Who is going to produce the food? That's the catch, you know. And the, the massive rise in organized crime. Yeah. 
massive rise in organized crime, trafficking, etc., warlords. So again, it would be a lot of dysfunction. And I think I, Western Europe is not just ready for that type of dysfunction. I think if that happened in Europe, you'd see a major rise in criminality. Because yeah. a lot of people wouldn't want to fight. So if they can't fight, they're immediately going to, going to become outlaws, etc. So what are they going to do? And again, the criminal gangs would start rising because, again, they tend to be more flexible and adaptable, a lot more entrepreneurial. So they'll be making money from the system and exploiting the system. Yeah, not necessarily money, but uh, any kind of benefits, like, uh, you know, to make their lives easier, you know. Yeah, any type of and, aid, any type of whatever, it's... Yeah. And every normal person uh, wouldn't like to be a prey of uh, such predators. <laughs> So they can go to the, they can join the military or they can join the predators. And this is it. There'd be no happy medium. And this is where I know in the US, there's communities of people say, okay, if this happens, we're going to protect our community. Europe doesn't have that community. Most of Europe, most of Europe, and we're talking Western Europe, that they don't have those community values anymore. It's gone. Mm -hmm. Whereas if we went back maybe 30, 50 years, okay, it was a completely different culture. The culture has changed. In some of the smaller countries in Europe, yes, they still have that mentality. They still have those values. But in the West, I'd say Western Europe, it's, it's gone. They don't have that. Mm -hmm. Do you know why I asked a question uh, about uh, uh, this uh, World War Three? Actually, uh, I noticed that uh, the trend uh, of every elections in most of the countries is so worry, <laughs> worrying uh, because uh, people elect uh, populists, uh, people mm -hmm. elect uh, demo uh, demagogues, uh, comedians, you know. Literally. Uh, but... Uh, they don't give a chance uh, to anybody who who is smart enough and brave enough to you know to take right decisions and say hey this is bs let's do this and i think the thing is with the political systems these days a lot of people saying it's corrupt yeah the, pe the, the people that's trying to make a difference and saying okay we need to check this as such as trump Look at the problems he's having. Unless you're from that elite group and you're you agree with what everybody says, more or less, unless you agree with everybody, they're not going to give you a chance to be part of their party. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's why I'm not in any political party because uh, I, I definitely have a issue uh, to obey to one man's or one person's uh, opinion because I'm uh, open for different views, different uh, options, ideas. Why not? You know, uh, maybe it sounds like uh, uh, crazy or, you know, but uh, if you go deeper, maybe you, you can find something that is useful, right? That's or, democracy. Or, yeah, yeah. That's what democracy is about. It's taking everybody's opinions and saying, okay, this could work, this couldn't work, what, what, what's best for the people? And I've just done something about this. And it's like, I think these days governments are self-serving and they're no longer serving the people. And they're not interested in the welfare of their people. They're worried about making money for themselves. Yeah. And I think it's pretty, about World War Three. I don't think, I think... There are leaders out there that would want it, that would push for it. And you see the, the, the warmongers in the West. But I think even if we're looking at, let's use the Houthis as an example, I think they, they're not going to push to the extreme because like, okay, we have a set goal. And if you sat down and talk to these people, they say, okay, thank you very much. We're friends. No worry. Let's drink some tea. All right? Yeah. But again, if you keep pushing them, then you're going to have a problem. Yeah, the same like with the Afghans. 
if you come with respect they will respect you back but if you come to do something that they don't like then you you have a problem yeah I think this one word that's missing in politics these days or in life in general is respect. If you respect people, they generally respect you back. The people that don't respect you is like, okay, they're they're not worth the time anyway. But again, if people respected other people's views, political political views, culture, religion, etc., I think you wouldn't have most of these problems you have today. But the trouble is, I think especially when you're dealing with politicians and diplomats these days, they're that arrogant that they think it's only their way there's no more diplomacy unless you do as we say unless you believe in what we believe in oh you're you're irrelevant they cannot make they cannot see the middle ground and one thing i learned years ago is you have to be able to look at things from everybody's perspective and i've lived with different cultures lived in different countries lived with different religions etc so maybe I can see things from different perspectives. But unless you can see things from the other side's perspective, you're never going to get a good result. You're never going to get um something which is workable for everybody. Everybody might not be 100% happy, but it's a workable solution. Yeah, speaking about workable solutions, you know, the uh, far right is uh, rising uh, uh, big mm. time. In certain countries, I, I made a video about uh, Germany and the uh, rise of uh, A uh, AFD, alter uh, alternative for Germany, and uh, you know there is a lot of populism which uh, people are buying uh, because they are vulnerable because of this economy crisis and you know and so on. So uh, they always uh, offer uh, easy easy solution you know but it rarely works you know it looks like easy but when you start in in implementing those solutions you find out uh, it's bs I've watched this in UK and UK had some right wing parties there used to be the national front i forget what it come after that bmp or whatever and again when you get and i again you can blame i blame the wokeism for this because whenever you're pushing one agenda there's always going to be a reaction from the other side so this is where the wokeism has been, po been pushing immigration been pushing uh, lgbq rights whatever and i don't care what people do it's, it's their business yeah, I it's understand a private people, issue. Yeah. It's, it's a private issue. It's, it's your business. It's their business. Um, but again, it's like when you start pushing this on people, you're beginning to push the normal person to the fringe. You're starting to discriminate. Mm -hmm. And you're bound to get a reaction. Whereas, and I think these days, there's no happy medium where people are like, okay, we you can't just be normal and have common sense. I see this a lot in the US. You've got to belong to one camp or the other. And if you're not in any of these camps, okay, you must be with them. You must be, you're an outcast. You are good right? for nothing. <laughs> you're good for nothing. You have to believe in this. And if you believe in this, you believe in that. You know what? Part of my business is guns, firearms. And in, in the United States, it's a political issue. Mm -hmm. And to me, a gun is a gun. It's a tool. We train people. That's it. I'm not worried about politics. Your politics is up to you as long as you're a good person, respectable person, respectful person. I'll do business with you. Yeah. I'm not worried about politics. But again, it's such the, the political issue these days is, I don't know, it's causing more and more divisions. And the more and more divisions you get, then you get the right wing, the Nazis. Etc. And again, I've heard people say in UK, oh, but they're, they're dealing with immigration, they'll deal with immigration. You know what? I wouldn't want to live under a fascist government. Yeah. I do you mean you might as well be to me it's a complete no no. I've got friends of all cultures, all religions, all colors. I don't want my friends to be discriminated against. So this is where there's workable solutions to the immigration, to the economy, to all these perpetual wars. But the government the leaders in power for some reason 
are not they're not working for their people they're not working for peace they're not working for prosperity they're working for themselves that's it yeah actually i, I noticed the uh, uh, afd uh is you know they have kind of manifesto whatever they call it and they advocate uh, to kick out uh, all uh, immigrants i'm wondering who would uh, work in germany exactly you know immigration is a they're not they are not only thinking about uh, illegal immigrants but also yeah, uh, G germans you know mm -hmm. uh, but uh, not original germans but with german passport mm -hmm. you know what i mean yeah, I know what you mean. Somebody who, who lived, let's say, 40, 50 years uh, in Germany, suddenly, for uh, according to their uh, six standards, uh, they are not German enough. You know, I look, I, who, I, I, who would work? <laughs> I look at it like this, right? Illegal immigrants, they're illegal. Yeah. They should be returned. Yeah. If people if people who come legally to a country, they're working, they're paying taxes... Okay, they're an asset to that country. Yeah. Let's use UK as an example. Okay? Or bash them again. Okay, I know how many immigrants that's come in legally. They own businesses. They've done very well for themselves. They're employing people. They're paying taxes. I know how many of these right-wing Brits that sit on their asses and collect government money. Yeah. And they go to the pub, they get drunk, and they watch football games, soccer games. That's it. You know what? If I had to choose between who I wanted in my country, be it an immigrant from somewhere else that's hardworking, got a business, doing this, doing that, hustling, paying their taxes, or one of these bums, I'd be okay. You might be British, but you know what? Start swimming. That's it. And I think this is it. You've got to. It's um, the trouble is with all this. How can we put it? The right wing is they're blind, and people will believe it. Because, yeah, people at the moment are getting bashed and bashed and bashed. It gives them some hope. Oh, we'll change things. No, they'll end up making the same mistakes and causing the same problems, if not more problems, than the government in power. These people will get to power, and all they're going to be thinking about is lining their own pockets. That's it. Well, to me, it looks like uh, Europe is, again, making uh, the same mistake, like... Uh back in 30s uh, last century i don't know uh, good sign is that uh, i also noticed uh, protests uh, and calls for banning uh, ultra nationalist uh, right wing parties and a lot of people uh, gathered uh, on those protests that's a good sign that means there are still a lot of people who are using the brains you know and mm -hmm. they are resisting to cheap propaganda which brings only hope and promises but this is the other the thing is the people talk about the ultra right right wing you got to think about the ultra left wing as well yeah where but... you look at united states antifa Antifa caused too many problems. They destroyed, they, I've never been to that part of the United States, Portland, Oregon, Seattle. They reckon there's places there. They used to be very prosperous places. They're now slums. Mm -hmm. But again, these people have taken so much money from donations, from this, from Soros and everybody else. Okay, the people at the top are wealthy. They just cause dysfunction and they try to undermine things for the normal hard-working, tax-paying people. Mm -hmm. So I think extremism from left or right is like there's there's too many rumblings of it these days and people, the world needs to get back to common sense negotiation and uh, finding happy mediums and workable solutions instead of saying it's either my way or no way. That doesn't work. Yeah, every extremism is not good. And uh, let's not forget... 2024 is year of elections in many countries. Yeah. So what would you uh, give a, as advice to people when they come to the ballot box 
you know. <laughs> I don't vote. I think it's people need to do what they think, but I think there needs to be people talked about the great reset. Mm -hmm. And I think the great reset is going to be the change in the old order. I think you're going to see Brex moving forwards, et cetera. And I think when people go to vote, they need to make a decision whether they want to stay with the old order, which is crumbling or mm -hmm. go with the new order. The trouble is with a lot of the European countries, they don't have the option of voting for anybody that's in with the new order. They're stuck with the old order. Mm -hmm. uh, when you are speaking about world order, uh, what do you think about uh, those uh, meetings in Davos, you know, World Economic Forum? So do they have a prosperous future? Are they going to uh make us uh owing nothing and being happy <laughs> you touched on a few things there i didn't realize until i think last year that the world Econor economic forum is like a private organization yeah it is <laughs> swab charles swab uh, uh, yeah swab. i think it's charles swab man right? swab what was his what what was his father yeah a nazi right his father was a was in with Nazi Germany. So again, it's like, I don't know how a private organization is has got so much power. And I think this comes down to, I'm all for individual company, countries having their own power and their own opinions. Mm -hmm. Because every country should have its own culture, its own politics, its own opinions. Um, I think it's very treasonous for countries to go to places like the World Economic Forum and allow the economic forum, World Economic Forum to tell them what to do. I think if a country should be, countries should be independent for their people, leaders should be independent for their people. So to go to places like that and all these global associations and take their opinions and do as you're told is uh, pretty treasonous because that way you see the leaders are not working for the interests of the people, they're working for the interests of the World Economic Forum. Yeah, some an analysts, uh, they say that uh, uh, these riots uh, far of farmers uh, throughout Europe uh, are actually indicator that uh, World Economic Forum uh, agenda is uh, facing difficulties. Because you cannot control uh, entire population just like that. No, and what are these farmers? Who's going to grow the food? Yeah, this is the basic thing. Who's going to grow the food? Yeah, it's an essential instinct of survival. You need food, and it's back yeah. down to this whole European Union thing. To me, it doesn't work. I'd sooner see independent countries and where people can be self-sufficient. Countries should be self-sufficient, and back down to if World War Three happens, okay. If you have to rely on your food to come from somewhere else, are they going to say, are people going to send it if they're starving? It's not going to work. Yeah. So I think if we go back to the basics, the basics of humans, humans need to be self-sufficient. And I think people have got so advanced, not advanced, well, they got blinded by um, this whole globalism. They've actually forgotten about what being a human is actually about. And that's people being self-sufficient. People need to eat. They need security. They need uh, stability to grow their fa for the to raise their families, etc. And they need a good economy. But the globalists are more interested in their agenda. Yeah. And I think we're going to see, hopefully, in the next few years, that can start to uh, collapse big time. Yeah. Only a few years ago, if you would uh, mention uh, World Economic Forum. Uh, let's say also Monsanto uh, company uh, and uh, agricultural uh, riots uh, in uh, inside European Union. Mm -hmm. People would say you are uh, propagating uh, conspiracy theory, but now it's a reality. Actually, a lot of people they 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 can see. Uh, that uh, who is going to uh, when uh, when they put restrictions on food production 
uh, small farmers uh, they would give up uh, it's it's not profitable and they have to give their land for nothing and who is going to buy it but it's back down to why is it natural is it normal to restrict people from growing food it's insane <laughs> if you it's what people do and if the farmers can sell the food they make money yeah right? it's business people have always done that all of a sudden to say no you can't grow your own food no this country cannot produce their own food you're going to do this you're going to do that it's it, it doesn't make sense to me yeah it's against everything that's human and a lot of the stuff that's going on these days i think if you look at to me humans and animals we're all animals we're just a different species of animal and i think the way things are going we've gone how can i put it we're going too far off track from what being a human is actually about mm -hmm. if that makes sense that might be a little bit out there but i think when you look at what humans need and human values what a lot of the leadership's doing these days is going completely off track they're going in a completely different direction but what leadership we are talking about <laughs> Yeah, we we'll sum up the leadership, right? There is no leadership. <laughs> like again, if you look at most of these people, would you give them a job? No. Especially in, again, we'll use the British Prime Minister that's unelected. He's on about fighting, going and fighting Russia. Would you trust that man to go and fight anybody? Well, Would you respect I... him as a leader? Yeah. I don't, I don't respect him. To me, he's a little, I can't say what I think of him because it's your podcast. But again, it's like, I, I, I just look at the guy and it's like, I couldn't respect him. I don't care what color he is. It's like, he's a he's an overprivileged little grown up child. That's it. Well, uh, I was a leader uh, while I was uh, still active on my duties and people could always see me in front, mm -hmm. going first. And we're back to that. We're back to respect. The and I respect would, them. I would respect those uh, people who pretend to be leaders, to be in front of me, to show me the way, and say, "Do what I do," <laughs> you know. Yeah. And again, it's like you look at, okay, what have these people done? How many of these leaders these days, supposed leaders, they live in a bubble. They live in an overprivileged bubble. Yeah. So how can they relate to the normal people? They can't. So if you can't relate to normal people, and again, I've said this about UK, and again, you see it from a lot of places. Okay, there's enough in highly intelligent people that's coming from middle class, working class backgrounds that could be top leaders of the country. But they're not given the opportunity to get to that level because they're not allowed to. Because again, if you look at a lot of Western Europe, UK especially, it's a monarchy, it's not a democracy, it's a caste system. Mm -hmm. But they're still in denial that it's a caste system and they tell everybody they're in a democracy so people believe they're in a democracy. Yeah, you can be elected up to a certain level and then that's it. No further. Yeah. No further. That's okay. the world we live in. Okay, thank you very much for one more uh, very inspiring uh, podcast. I hope uh, our audience would uh, uh, drag something, you know, some piece of wisdom from, from you because uh, it's always uh, nice to talk to you and uh, let's stay in touch. So Yeah, 100%, 100%. I'm sure we'll, we might bump into each other in the near future. Okay, I might be heading your way. So we'll see what happens. Okay. All right, mate. Okay, until next time. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Bye.